It's with added pleasure that I uh, welcome my mom and dad, Ralph and Shirley, and my wife, Carol. Uh, they are both, all three here today, without the support of my family and so many wonderful friends in this room. Uh, I could not enjoy the success, and you all motivate me every day to have the half glass full mentality that I bring to City Hall each and every day. Last year this time, I stood before you with a laundry list of projects and initiatives being spearheaded by your city government. The headline the next day read, Expectations Exceeded. Fortunately, that continues to be a recurring act, reaction, whether it's in City Hall or through interactions with citizens who want to become more engaged in their community. This past year, the city's first visioning process, referred to as VOICE, through more than 3,000 citizens to speak up and relay their preferred vision for our city. The city and leadership Evansville developed the Voice Initiative, which is about building trust among the members of our community and learning that if we all join together with, and have civil dialogue about our future desires and current issues, we can create a strong society that will thrive and grow. With a renewed sense of pride, optimism, and citizen engagement, our city becomes more and more vibrant each and every week. From the 42 organized voice sessions and online input, we know that our citizens, citizens desire uh, healthy green spaces, enhanced experiences for a fun city, and a revitalized urban core. We know that regardless of their residency, an overwhelming number of our citizens understand the need for strengthening our urban core, which is why more and more people are living downtown, investing in everything from historic homes in our preservation area to modern new condominiums on Main Street. As a direct result of voice, residents are not only suggesting major capital projects as part of their vision, but also coming up with easy and fun items, such as planting 1,200 uh, tulip bulbs near the Greenway, hosting pop-up restaurants and mob cash bars. Yes, those are good. <laughs> good things. Fun things. Our downtown is blessed to have many attractions that are first class. Historic Victory Theater is home to our wonderful Philharmonic Orchestra. We have touring Broadway productions. We have an energetic farmer's market, art shows, sculptural exhibits. We have a fabulously renovated Museum of Arts, History, and Science that complements our world-class children's museum, the Evansville African American Museum, and the Wright's Home Museum. We have a professional hockey team. In fact, some might think we've turned into a hockey town. Many of us, including me, have learned what a hat trick is and what an enforcer really means. <laughs> Actually, I could use an enforcer from time to time. <laughs> we have both Division I and Division II basketball with story uh, programs from the University of Evansville and the University of Southern Indiana. And it only made sense that the Great Lakes Valley Conference basketball tournament, men, men's and women's tournament, was here again this last weekend, and a special congratulations to the USI men's team for bringing home their 12th GLB. We wish them the best as they continue in the NCAA <laughs> Division II tournament. And in just a matter of weeks, the NCAA Division II Elite Eight will be here. So that means the Na Division II National Champion will be crowned right here live on CBS at the Ford Center, not only this year, but in 2015 as well. It's certainly been said that the community is only as strong as its center core. But fortunately for Evansville, we also have tremendous momentum on the west side with new energy being promoted from the Franklin Street Events Association. New events such as the Mardi Gras in Franklin, in addition to the famous uh, fall festival hosted by the West Side Nut Club, are citizen-driven events that continue to grow. The Jacobsville Area Community Corporation is another organization that deserves recognition for their redevelopment efforts for being undertaken there and the ownership that they've taken of the annual Christmas on North Main Street uh, Parade, which is another great success. You know, sometimes communities need to reflect on their blessings and their assets. Maybe like many cities, we tend to overlook the positive, which is why everything I've mentioned here so far is so important. Over the past few years, we've, uh, you've heard me use phrases like poise for the future, and now is the time. Well, my favorite phrase is positive progress, which I hope you would agree adequately defines our ongoing collaborative efforts to move our city forward. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to our united efforts, the state of our city is truly invigorating and creating a new excitement for the city of Evansville.
Evansville's positive progress can be attributed to a lot of fine organizations and people, both inside government and out. As we provide the annual status report of our city government, it only makes sense to recognize those who are committed to public service. Many of our city department heads are here today, and you should know that these are extraordinarily dedicated men and women who work every day to make Evansville better. Would you all please stand and be recognized? In addition, we have a number of members of our common council here today. Would you please stand up? It, you know, I think it's fair to say we don't always agree on everything. I know there are more of you than just those three. Please stand up. But I think it's fair to say that unlike our friends in Washington, we do sit down and figure out how to move forward in the best possible way. A prime example of collaboration and compromise was securing the long-awaited convention hotel in downtown Evansville. Just yesterday, we broke ground on the new 257-room Doubletree by Hilton with our develop developer, HCW, out of Branson, Missouri. Joining us today is President and CEO Rick Huffman and his partner, Sam Cantonese. We have the H and the C in HCW. General, would you please, would you please stand? been said many times that at other, other public events, but it's worth repeating and underscores the, uh, the collaboration that goes on in our city. The combined support of the business community and the labor community was instrumental in making this project happen. And I could not be more pleased for that collaboration. And as a result of all that hard work, uh, we're going to be open in the fall of 2015. And with that, I'm pleased to announce that we've already booked our first convention. The Indiana Association of Cities of Indiana. The Indiana Association of Cities and Towns will host its annual convention in the new hotel shortly after it opens. The last time the statewide convention was here was in 2007, and the leadership of that organization is delighted to come back to Evansville. Now, as construction begins, it's now the task of Bob Warren and his capable staff, the convention is the Business Bureau to recruit business back to Evansville and blah, Bob, uh, I want you to know that our community is behind you and uh, Bob and his team will soon be breaking ground on their own attraction, the new Ballfield Complex off of North Green River Road, which is yet another attractive selling point for our city. Now, if I gave Bob the mic, and don't worry, I won't, because we've been here for so long, uh, I know he would encourage all of us to get involved in the communities that we're involved with and get them to and sell Evansville to them. That's our best selling point. As our visitors come to Evansville, the award-winning Doubletree Hotel service will be awaiting for them, along with a special treat, the Doubletree Signature Chocolate Chip Cookie, which, if you haven't noticed, is already at your place <laughs> That's what our visitors will enjoy when they come to town. You can wait till I'm done, that's okay. As you know, a new convention hotel has been a primary focus of officials for many years, not only to boost the convention business, but to create a much needed economic development tool. This project will create hundreds of construction and permanent jobs, in addition to being a catalyst for growth. Two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of joining the leadership of the Economic Development Coalition at a National Site Selector Conference to meet the professionals that work with corporations seeking to relocate or start their business operations. Let's just let me tell you this, the business of economic development is cutthroat and very competitive. Not only do corporations want the best deal, but they also want to locate in cities that have a robust quality of life. A few weeks ago, the news of, our, of the latest unemployment numbers for our city and our region reinforced our region's efforts, the lowest unemployment rate in the past five years. While not every deal becomes a reality, the local economy is rebounding and growing. And while our jobs team responds to requests and proactively seeks new potential deals, the successes of 2013 were the retention and expansion of major employers such as Uniseal, SS&C, and Berry Plastics. We spent a fair amount of time in 2012 and 2013 working with our friends at Barry on separate expansion projects. As a result of that collaboration over the last two years, they've created 395 new jobs here in Evansville. Barry has become a tremendous driver of our local economy and to the many suppliers throughout this region. 
Special thanks to Jonathan Wrench and his leadership team for continuing to grow and invest in Evansville. Business startups have also been a positive niche for the Growth Alliance, utilizing the incubator space at Innovation Point and the Vanderburg Industrial Park. Involve Engineering, Inflow, Exergy Resources, Curbo are just a few of the new companies that are receiving assistance there. And frankly, the innovation and creativity of our homegrown business is inspiring and should be embraced by our entire community. A key component to our ensuring our local economy grows is building a strong transportation infrastructure, whether it's for pedestrian, bike, or vehicle traffic. Significant investments have been made to, uh, in repairing sidewalks, improving intersections, and paving streets. The Oak Hill Road reconstruction project will be complete this July. I'd like to thank everyone who uses that road for their patience, uh, especially the residents in that area. You've coped with lane closures, lane changes, um, limited access, and detours for the past nine months, but the light is at the end of the tunnel. I will tell you, over the past 24 years, City Engineer Pat Kibas has been overseeing projects like Oak, Hill, like Oak Hill, and is still one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in the Civic Center. <laughs> After serving for four mayors, Pat will soon be leaving us. He'll be joining his bride to be in Indianapolis. Pat, I'd like to, where are you, Pat? I saw you earlier right there. I'd like to take this time to publicly thank you for your dedication. <laughs> Not to mention his insights and creativity were invaluable on a certain high-profile interchange projects that, project that's in the center of our community. It's quite obvious that substantial change is occurring at the interchange of US 41 and the Lloyd Expressway. The plans remain to have traffic flowing on the new full cloverleaf in the fall of 2015. Clearing and demolition work is ongoing and utility relocation will follow. Now, to avoid long traffic delays and disruption in the service, the Indiana Department of Transportation has developed a shorter construction timetable time, time with practical design elements added that will produce long-term savings for this project. Those savings will benefit both the state of Indiana and the city of Evansville. The original $2.5 million investment from the Evansville Metropolitan Planning Organization will be returned and NDOT will now cover the costs associated with the enhanced lighting of the interchange, which would have cost the city about $800,000. The collaboration of this project has been tremendous and a prime example of the innovation that's being applied. Our Parks Department continues to thrive and find efficiencies in its operations and maximize its available resources. Both an updated park master plan and Greenway connectivity study will be performed this year. The previous master park plans from 2003 and 2009 both urge enhanced green space and connectivity between the city parks. Regardless, we know our parks always need work, whether it's maintenance or repurposing equipment, which is what we just recently completed at Sheridan Park on the north side. And we were very fortunate to have Lorraine Park Neighborhood Association and Councilwoman Missy Mosby <laughs> take the initiative to partner with the city on a new playground equipment at Lorraine Park. That equipment at Lorraine with, in the park at Six and Castleberry on the west side were installed last month and believe it or not have already received a lot of attention from the kids in those areas. The last park master plan from 2009 recommended that a reuse redevelopment plan for Roberts needed to be developed and that alternative uses, uses need to focus on expansion of park and recreation <coughs> opportunities. Through an extensive public engagement process we heard the community loud and clear the former site of Roberts Stadium should be green space. The proposed Roberts Park is a project that was based on the recommendation and desires of the citizens that participated in those meetings and submitted feedback online to our office. The citizen input has improved the conceptual plan and as I have continually said, the land represents a unique opportunity to create wonderful green space in the heart of our city. Last year, early estimates on enhancements to the park were the former Robert Stadium stood ranged from six to eight million dollars. Thanks to our friends at the Welburn Foundation, our team is still working on the plan with the goal of meeting that range. However, the final product will be further based on public input and private investment. During the public review process, hundreds of comments and questions were submitted. The support for a new dog park was obvious. However, the exact location was questioned even by supporters. So we went to work with the state of Indiana. We believe the recommendation of utilizing a portion of the land next to the state hospital ground 
uh, or state hospital already informally used for that purpose would be ideal. And thanks to our local legislative delegation for supporting language and legislation to uh, be approved by the General Assembly that week, this week, we think the transfer of that land will happen soon. The connectivity between the state hospital grounds and Roberts Park via the planned pedestrian crosswalk will cre create a tremendous synergy. Whether you take the crosswalk or driving past the future Roberts Park, this will feature will certainly make a huge statement. And speaking of huge statements, we're about to make one right now. This is a great opportunity to announce that the Rotary Club of Evansville will commit $100,000 to be the sponsor of the Rotary Centennial Wetland at Roberts Park to provide both an aesthetic an educational component of the park that will be inviting and usable by all ages. I am most appreciative. <laughs> when you hear the term wetland, you probably think of how wetlands, um, and while equally useful, the Rotary Centennial Wetland will be a special area that will incorporate the Rotary four-way test and have a natural connection to the educational programs at Westwood Nature Center, only a trail away. On behalf of the City of Evansville, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Jeffrey and the leadership team here and all who contributed to the Centennial fundraising efforts. It is our intent that the Rotary Centennial Wetland will be one of the first projects constructed in truly a public-private partnership in this new park. Well, as you know, our administration has also been engaged in the Civic Pride campaign, Clean Evansville, one of our first initiatives since taking office in 2012. Since that time, we've engaged more than 3,500 volunteers and picked up over 50,000 pounds of trash. Yes, 50,000 pounds of trash. Clean Evansville's success recently earned the city the 2013 Indiana Association of Cities and Towns Community Achievement Award. This program would not be possible without the support of Keep Evansville Beautiful, Republic Services, Rule King, and volunteers from several businesses that participate in a cleanup on a monthly basis, including we have, we have folks from uh, Vectran, Acuride, Fifth Third Bank, Old National Bank, and countless scout groups and church groups month in and month out. Thank you very much for making our city look and feel better. I'd like to switch gears to the city's financial situation for a moment. I'm pleased to report that the city's financial state position is stable. Yes, like most every community, we have issues, but our department heads have done a phenomenal job of adjusting their budgets without a detrimental effect on the delivery of services. At times, misinformation may lead you to believe otherwise, but don't be fooled. The city continues to grow, and so does the demand for services. The city is blessed to have sources of funds not dependent on property taxes, for the purpose of investing in our quality of life. As mentioned before, those investments should not halt and are critical in driving additional development as evidence from our interactions with the economic development professionals and citizens alike. The bond rating agencies are pleased with our financial position as they have affirmed our previously favorable ratings. Strong statements that our bonds are, quote, high quality and subject to low credit risk are certainly welcome news. Finding creative ways to save money is a directive given to every department head, regardless of how large the amount. As a result of hedging the price, when the market was favorable, the city was able to save $95,000 last year on fuel alone. And our administration has also put a strong emphasis on workplace and worker safety. This includes training, working with insurance personnel, safety experts, department heads and supervisors to emphasize safety. The results are impressive. Since taking office, our workers' compensation claims have decreased 32%, which translates to a decrease of over $300,000. Now, in any honest assessment of our city, we have to acknowledge that we have challenges ahead. And it shouldn't be breaking news to anyone here today that at the top of our list of challenges is our water and sewer utility department. I'd like to recognize the gentleman who leads that effort, Alan Mounts, right over here. Alan deserves special recognition for successfully managing the, uh, the 
polar vortex, <laughs> and the chemical plume, and our request for conservation. And he's probably been the only person in city government or local government to surpass me for more FaceTime on TV this winter. <laughs> I'm about that. Seriously, Al and his team have done, a, have done a fabulous job. They've worked long, long hours in horrendous weather to oversee and repair a record number of water main breaks, manage the upriver chemical spill, and as I said, the conservation request. In addition, we continue to have dialogue with the EPA regarding our integrated long-term control plan. Our 28-year, $540 million plan was submitted for the federal government's consideration last May. It should be noted that our plan is about $300 million less than what we would have needed to achieve the EPA's original desired level of control. And we intend to push back on any effort to further unduly burden our ratepayers. Evansville is one of more than 700 cities across the country mandated to make these upgrades. As the EPA reviews our plans, we certainly await their decision. Now, the water and sewer utility is not the only department that has aging equipment. Jay Perry and his team at the Levy Authority also replaced flat gates on our three major pump stations downtown. These flat gates were part of the original infrastructure installed in the 1940s. The new gates will keep water from backflowing into the city when the river reaches high levels. It's no surprise the common theme and the challenges here today we face relate to infrastructure needs. We need, now that the snow and ice has all disappeared, and it has all disappeared, we, we certainly hope, uh, a new foe has arrived. The foe is the pothole. <laughs> you might find this hard to believe, but since January, more than 1,100 potholes have already been filled. But the fluctuating weather patterns have certainly been a challenge to the city garage team and that, to tell you, they do a wonderful job. While our related infrastructure issues create the largest challenges from a monetary standpoint, you should be reassured that the aforementioned challenges all have plans to address them. Over the last two years, our administration has worked diligently to meet the needs of keeping the LST here in Evansville. Whether it was providing new storage space for the ship's landing vehicles, painting the dock, or increasing marketing efforts to bring visitors to the ship, the city is committed to keeping the historical vessel here in its birthplace. In April, the city will take, make a comprehensive presentation to the LST Board of Directors with the goal of extending the lease to the city of Evansville. Now, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of Mesker Park Zoo. I'm a, kind of a zoo guy. Amos Morris is sitting right up front. He and his team do a fantastic job. It's a big draw for the city. Last year, more than 200,000 people came through the doors. And believe it or not, Amazonia has already had its one million visitor. Kudos to former mayors Russ Lloyd Jr. and Jonathan Weinsau, as well as former zoo director and current city council member Dan McGinn for the vision and commitment to this wonderful attraction. And if you haven't been to the zoo lately, here's what you're missing. Improvements to the 60-year-old clay building that includes the Komodo Cove. We have three Komodo dragons. And we've welcomed an African crested porcupine, the red panda on the renovated Discovery Trail, two Mexican gray wolf pups, and a new colobus monkey. But we cannot rest on our laurels. We have some exciting and big ideas that we are working on to make the zoo even more exciting. And we'll even leave that as a teaser for the time being. Each week, our city is becoming more and more diverse. And with that comes an obligation to be more accepting, more understanding, and more inclusive. The open dialogue with the leadership of concerned clergy and the NAACP has been greatly appreciated and constructive in our, new, in our march toward uh, moving our community forward. As mayor, I must take seriously any feelings, real or perceived, regarding discrimination or bias. This is especially important of instances involving city employees who have frequent encounters with our citizens. To that end, beginning this year, all city employees, including the mayor, will undergo annual online training that introduces basic diversity concepts. This is one prong of a comprehensive approach to ensure city employees have the competencies they need to serve a diverse community. I'm also pleased to announce that the Evansville Police Department will soon roll out a new interactive community engagement program called Life on the Beat. This program, which includes a good deal of role playing, is designed to show our citizens why officers make the decisions they make. 
and no doubt it will give our officers insight into why our citizens may question some of those decisions. Life on the Beat will soon be rolling out to neighborhood associations, church groups, or civic clubs that are interested in learning more about the Evansville Police Department. And speaking of the police department, you should all know if you haven't heard, our uniform officers now each have high definition body cameras. These cameras are yet another tool available to assist law enforcement and should provide irrefutable evidence in our ongoing effort to protect our citizens. One of the few disappointments I've had in office so far has to do with a continu continuing scourge of meth and its impact on users, their families, especially kids in our community. While meth remains a problem, the city is the only municipality in the state that has a law enforcement department with a dedicated meth suppression unit. That means the city of Evansville simply doesn't react to the meth epidemic anymore. We take a proactive approach to the problem. I truly believe that meth will continue to be a problem, not just here, but around our region until the legislature approves making pseudoephedrine a controlled substance. Now, it's not often that an elected official recognizes the media for reporting on an issue that government is struggling to solve. If you've not read the ongoing series by the Evansville Courier and Press about blighted housing, I would encourage you to do so. It certainly highlights an issue that speaks to the look and feel of our historic city. While blight and abandoned homes are not a new problem, the challenge is ongoing and key towards our revitalization efforts. First, I think it's important to understand the problem. Last year, our building commissioner, building commission has been on the forefront. They managed over 1,000 separate property maintenance violation matters and responded to citizen concern that turned out over 3,800 inspections on blighted property. They issued over 500 administrative orders on the ceiling, repair, or raising of blighted buildings. They removed over 150 blighted homes by demolition and secured another 155, and soon will be seeking money from the state's hardest hit fund to be used on the acquisition and demolition of abandoned residential structures. <coughs> we responded to citizen concerns of high, weed. we had high weeds with over 8,000 inspections. And in the coming weeks, our administration will be proposing updates to the weed ordinance to strengthen the enforcement. The rental registry programs have helped identify more than 7,400 parcels of land that have rental units and the contact information for more than 2,800 different owners, saving city resources and tracking down those owners. It's our intent to further consolidate existing registries to maximize results. Clearly, our investments in removing blight from abandoned neighborhoods are striving towards stabilizing property values and improving the quality of life. Even so, more needs to be done by collaborating with neighborhood associations and residents that report problems. Well, the folks in the State House are starting to wrap up its work. The General Assembly is in its final hours. Conference committees are now meeting on key issues before they adjourn. The current legislative session has had several issue, issues that impact municipalities, and it's true that actions in the State House do have lasting impacts on city halls all across Indiana. In 2013, alone circuit breaker caps lowered property tax payments to the city by $9.4 million, a 100% increase over 2012. In response to our reduced revenue from caps, the responsibility of governing within our means rests on our shoulders, and that's exactly what is happening in our city hall. After learning that uh, December tax revenue, December 2013 tax revenue was lower than expected by about $2 million, actually the receipts went from 47.4 million to 46 million, our administration immediately started working with department heads to identify areas for budget reduction to address this shortfall. In the coming weeks, the proposed cuts to the city's general fund will be presented to city council for consideration. Fortunately, the city's investment in projects such as the new hotel, the medical education campus, or other capital projects will not be impacted as completely different funding mechanisms are utilized to ensure homeowners are not impacted. It's frustrating sometimes to travel to Indianapolis to testify on issues involving local government simply to hear that locals should tighten their belts only to have legislation considered that actually creates more problems than they solve. The current proposals regarding the business personal property tax are prime examples of good concepts but bad public policy. The Indiana Fiscal Institute agrees that a partial or full elimination of that tax would create a shift in that tax. 
So today I ask you to uh, call your legislators and ask them to oppose any attempts to shift that burden to resident, residential taxpayers. Whether it's voluntarily cutting budgets by millions of dollars, offsetting medical trends by expanding our on-site employee clinic, or cutting $11 million from a utility contract, you should know that your city government is tightening its belt. In terms of challenges, our region will soon be tasked with advocating that the General Assembly include the Medical Educational Center, the Med School Project, in the next biennial, biennial budget. There is no doubt that we are up to this challenge. The current IU Medical School, now hosted by the University of Southern Indiana, will be expanded and add the University of Evansville and Ivy Tech Community College. While my personal preference is for a downtown location, the tremendous educational collaboration and resulting economic development will have lost lasting impacts all across south, southwest Indiana. As we are united in support of Interstate 69, the same effort needs to be put behind this project regardless of its location. I pledge today to be a champion for obtaining the necessary funding and appro approvals from our state cabinet. I would be remiss if I did not recognize City Council Member Dr. Dan Adams, who has been an instrumental advisor on our proposal to the IU folks, has brought creativity and special insight to that process. Our, our proposal would not be what it is without Dr. Adams' input, and I appreciate that. You should know that there is positive progress going on all over the city. Whether it's the Westman Nature Center wrapping up its $1.5 million capital campaign or health enthusiasts all over the city who are clamoring to get Evansville designated as a bicycle friendly community, it's happening everywhere. We're blessed to have a really great not-for-profit network and we're even more blessed to have a volunteer network that goes above and beyond on a daily and weekly basis. Now, a status report of our city would not be complete without the mention of Interstate 69. Progress for the North continues, and NDOT will soon officially award the contract for Section 5, making the connection to Bloomington. You may have also caught a little bit of news recently about the route to the South. <laughs> My script doesn't even need to say smile here. <laughs> My longtime friend, Henderson Mayor Steve Austin, is with us today. Steve, would you join us? Brad Schneider, who leads us in our bridge link effort. Brad, I saw you earlier. Brad, back in the back. Brad, <laughs> truly a bi-state collaborative effort to get a built bridge built here, not anywhere else. <laughs> Let's put this in perspective for just a minute. The existing bridge structures carrying U.S. Truck 41 traffic are nearing the end of their life. The northbound bridge was built in 1932, the southbound bridge in 1966. My friends, this is not about two mayors butting heads with another mayor. This is about completing a project that two states and a federal government have already and rightfully committed to build on a specific site. This is not about grabbing headlines, this is about the completion of a significant highway of national importance. It's no And it's noteworthy that both Governor Pence and Governor Bashir have stood firm on this issue, that the route will not change and the bridge is needed. We appreciate their support. Construction of I-69 to the north is only part of the equation. The bridge linking Evansville and Henderson must be constructed. Evansville can't be the cul-de-sac on the interstate system. Likewise, Henderson, Madisonville, and Hopkinsville and other communities who have been trying to get connected to the interstate system should not be scratched at this time. My service on the Governor's Blue Ribbon Transportation Commission uh, has been productive and will soon release the priority projects for the state of Indiana and I can assure you that the completion of Interstate 69 to the north and to the south will be included in the final report. As we leave here today, I'd like to share with you an inscription on a plaque that I ran across recently. I, we were having a traveling city hall at Mossy High School. <coughs> Man, made it 40 minutes without coffee, sorry. Um, this is really, this plaque really inspired some, some thoughts for me. I would like to read it to you. 
reads Benjamin Bossy, a man of the people, whose life was spent and given in the service of the city which he helped to build. He labored unselfishly and untiringly in the cause of broader and higher education. This building is a monument erected in appreciative memory to a man whose life so generously given to every cause for human betterment continues its influence and is an inspiring example to the men and women who shall go out from the school. Pretty impressive. Without a doubt, Mayor Benjamin Bossy was one of our city's greatest leaders. His style and enthusiasm for this city may never be matched, but we can all strive to match his commitment to public service and to improve the quality of life here. Make Evansville a great city for the present day and for generations to come. So, if I had the power of the pen to create tomorrow's headline about this speech, it would say this. So it really emulates Mayor Bossy's spirit. Evansville is united in positive progress. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your commitment to the city of Evansville. May God bless you and the city of, the, and the city of Evansville.